Hello and welcome to the Naughty Mythology Podcast. I'm Daniel Farrand, co-owner of the Cumney Horns Vodin, and I'm joined, as always, by Dr. Matthias Nordvig. Hello. All right, so this time we have a very interesting guest. It is uh, Janette Vaber from the uh, Danish Na uh, National Museum. Uh, Janette is a curator there uh, and an archaeologist of prof uh, general profession, I guess. And uh, that's how you say it. And uh, Janette, aside from being, I guess, one of the most uh, um, uh, sought after and pop uh, popular uh, archaeologists in Denmark these days, uh, for various reasons, uh, you are also the publisher of the book um, that I guess is translated into English at this point. It's called no. Viking, or yeah. not not translated yet. No, it's uh, the the only la la uh, country that wants to translate it is Serbia. So it's coming up in <laughs> Serbia next year. But <laughs> that's unfortunate. <laughs> yeah. but it's, a, it's a it's a really popular book in Denmark, and the, yeah. uh, the translated title is Viking Pillage fire and sword, as I understand it. So very much welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Yeah, thank you. I I can't believe it's not translated into English. That seems completely bizarre. Yes, and I actually, I ask my agents because as a, as a writer, uh, then the Vikings must be the one that could sell you off to, to another country. But... Um, I wrote a very popular book, but also a very thick book. It's more than 600 pages, and that is costly to translate, I, is the general message. So mm -hmm. I made the mistake to write too much, I guess. <laughs> um, I, I guess so. I mean, the Vikings seem so popular in, in Britain and in America that you would think that English would be an obvious language for it. Absolutely. I'm still, I, uh, I have my fingers crossed anyway. <laughs> yeah, I do because I like to say I, 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 for sure I would uh, grab a copy because unfortunately I can't read Danish. Uh, there's a lot of pictures though, so maybe you should get one uh, anyway. <laughs> that sounds like my kind of book, to be honest. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds perfect for me. So um, the the first thing that that I know is when I you know if if anybody looks up your your name is you did a lot of research on. Is it the glass beads and you linked them back to Egypt? Is that right? Am I correct in that? Yes, um, I am a Bronze Age expert and that's where I mainly do my research. And actually, it was kind of a coincidence because I was going through the storage of a, a Danish museum called Moskow Museum. It's in Aarhus. And they had from the Bronze Age, that's 3,300 years ago, more or less, they had some blue and I was making an exhibition there and I was wondering why I didn't know anything about blue glass beads from the Bronze Age. And I did know quite a lot, I thought. So I asked some, some colleagues and they didn't know either where they came from. And then I got in contact with uh, a laboratory in Orléans where uh, Professor Bernard Gratus, he is uh, head of a laboratory who specialized in analyzing glass, metals and obsidian. And I sent him a small sample from one glass bead and he made uh, a test and it shows that it came from Mesopotamia around uh, today's Iraq. And that uh, just uh, how do they how do they know that? Do, they, I, I mean, I, I, I mean, if if it's you know, if you don't know that, that's fine. But like, I I don't know how can you tell where glass comes from? That that's also mind blowing because I didn't know either. But absolutely. But every piece of glass that is made in a pot in an old fashioned way, you take glass is made of uh, quartz sand. That's very very. Um, fine sand without any uh, impurities. It's, mm -hmm. it's clean. And then you take some uh, flux, and that could be some kind of ash that lowers the melting point. So you can, can easily get it melting. And then you put in some kind of chemicals. It could be copper. It could be the colorant uh, that's called cobalt. And then iron, iron makes it uh, yellow or red, uh, copper or cobalt makes it blue or greenish. 
and then you actually crack the code of making glass and you may that code is cracked around uh, 3600 years ago in Mesopotamia and uh, then it the knowledge spreads throughout the Mediterranean area and also one big glass uh, workshop is found in Amana in Egypt and this is where it's this strange city built by Akhenaten who was maybe the father of Tutankhamun the the famous uh, pharaoh he was he was not famous in his time because he died as a teenager and he had some he was crippled more or less but he uh, his tomb was found in the 20s 1920s and now of course is the most famous archaeological find to this date mm-hmm. and uh, what i found out is that you can trace glass by melting it with a laser and then uh, the the melted glass is analyzed by this big machine really it is <laughs> and it can can get the the different kinds of uh, components in the glass and then you have a, refer- a reference material of other glass and you can see if it's the same components chemical components that's uh, in the other samples. So you kind of have a, a, a tr- um, a, a, you have something in a database and you run it through and say, oh, there's a match here. So it is made in Mesopotamia. And then we came down with the National Museum of Denmark have, has a, a really a, a big collection. So we brought that back with us to, to um, Orlean. And one of the very, very... A uh, lucky coincidence was that in the eight, uh, eight, 1890s, I think, there was an archaeologist, English archaeologist, British, called uh, Petrie. He was making a lot of digs in Egypt, and he was founded by different museums all over Europe. So if one museum in Munich, one in Berlin, and one in London were paying him to make an ex- ex- excavation in Egypt, he will, would, would decide which kind of the finds will go to where. So he would put a third to Munich, a third to Berlin, and a third to London. And he was digging in Amana, where Akhenaten was his, his city, where Tutankhamun and Nefertiti and all the famous ones were living. This glass workshop, he did the digging, and guess who f- who funded it? The National Museum of Denmark. And I yeah. discovered I discovered that in a footnote in a in a in a in a book about glass. And then I could just go up one uh, one floor at the museum and say at in the antique collection and say, "Hey, do you have glass?" <laughs> any coincidence and they say yeah we have a lot so instead of me sending i don't know how many applications to london or to to the united states um where the big collections are i could just go to my colleagues and say okay i need this and this and this sometimes you need that little bit of luck absolutely and it was just mind-blowing that i could do that but mm. anyway we had was what what was important here is that we have our own reference material from Amana with us. And that reference material had a clear, clear match with two glass beads from Denmark. Wow. So we know, actually, you can see, if you close your eyes, you can see the golden mask of Tutankhamun. And if you mm. see the blue stripes, mm. they are not made of stone. They are made of glass, and this glass is made of cobalt-colored glass. And we know now that this cobalt is is made probably in what is called the Dakla oasis in Sahara. And we have a very, very nice female grave from Ulbu. It's actually, if you want to translate that directly into English, it's called the town of Beer, Ulbu. Now, now we're talking. Now we're talking. <laughs> and here, a female was was uh, buried. 
It's okay. He M- okay. Mateus is still there. Sometimes his video just decides to drop off. Okay, oh. super. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> yes, you are. And uh, but in Ulbu, there's a female grave, and uh, she is. It's a very very special grave from Bronze Age. It's three thousand four hundred years old. It's more or less at the same time as Tutankhamun and Akhenaten and everything's going on. She is buried with a sk- sh- short skirt with uh, tubes of bronze on each string on the st- skirt. So she has been making a s- kind of music, musical sounds when she was walking. And oh, she wow. had a belt plate on her stomach. It's like a, a plate in 15 centimeter in a diameter made out of bronze that would be very shiny. And she probably didn't have a blouse on, so she was bare-breasted. That was the kind of way people looked in the Bronze Age, or some women did. We also have small figurines showing that. And she had a broken sword, a mass, a really big broken sword with her as well, as part of her her um, uh, her her grave. Um, um, the the clothes or, or or the the suit she was wearing in the grave mm-hmm. part of that was a broken sword and on her upper arm she had amber beads and one blue bead that was actually made of glass from Egypt wow i mean th- first of all from all of that I, the one takeaway that i get is that science is brilliant <laughs> i mean like to be able to, to to date glass like that to to an exact place, I think is absolutely amazing. And and I can't help but think in thirty, forty, fifty years, what what will be available that isn't available now to learn even more that you know we just that we just don't know now. Yeah, exactly. And also, what is interesting me as a Bronze Age researcher is also that. This has been a powerful woman for bo- most of the glass beads are put in female graves, and and some of them um, are also graves with female who has weapons with them, because mm-hmm. that was actually very common in the Bronze Age Denmark that females were buried with with daggers. Mm. And the da- some of the daggers are so big that if they were found in a male grave, you would have uh, called them a short sword. Mm. Yeah, because when it's a female grave, it's a small dagger. When it's in a male grave, you call it a sword. <laughs> so, of course. Of course, yes. But the thing is that in the Bronze Age, you actually have female burials with weapons. And okay. there's a lot of them. There are more than a hundred. So, oh, wow. so this is uh, it, it shows and that's that only from the Danish area, Danish, North Germany, and some from Norway and Sweden. But but okay. the main finds is also the most rich finds uh, is from South Scandinavia or Denmark. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So, I guess the question for me is: Do we know how the beads got to Denmark? Uh, at what point was there? It was like a trade link, or yes, uh, I'm working with researchers and museums uh, throughout uh, Europe, and uh, we find that the same kind of beads are found in the western route that goes through France, Germany, and up, and then there are an eastern route that goes through uh, uh, Transylvania or Romania and this way up. And I've been uh, uh, excavating in a cave in Romania, in the Transylvanian forest called Chuklovina Kuapu. And it's the Chuklovina wet cave. And you have to walk through a river uh, 500 meters inside a cave coming out of a mountain. Then you climb a waterfall, and you climb one more, and then you are in a really, really big cave. It's like a cathedral. And the river is coming out from beneath the, the rock. And if you look, it's on your right side, and you look up on your left side, there's a, 
is uh, there's a, a natural high, maybe five, ten meters up, where there's a plateau. And up here, you have also A and B, as we call it. And here you have found, we have found a treasure containing more than se uh, 7,500 glass beads, bronze beads, and amber beads. Wow, it sounds like something out of Indiana Jones. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, like a, a cave behind a, a waterfall, and it's... Uh, <laughs> yes, and it's very I mean, different. I, I guess that's why they're still there. Maybe is because they're in such a, yeah, a remote. It's, it's very difficult, and um, and yeah, I I do not look like Indiana Jones going in. I'm I'm in a <laughs> wetsuit. Uh, if it's not too cold, um, I've been in there in the winter as well. And then I'm 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 trying to climb the walls not to get wet. At one time, it did. I got wet anyway. It was really cold. Mm -hmm. Um, but but I'm not that elegant as, as uh, Indiana Jones. But last time, I went out with the professional climbers because we had to go the other way <laughs> up. You have to go 50 meters up inside a cave where it's totally dark. And uh, you only have your own lights. And it's slippery and it's wet. You cannot see a thing. And I'm, I'm, not, the, I'm not a climber th type at all. Uh, so I had to go up there. And but because I have to overlook uh, the excavation, do it. Uh, the excavation is normally by professional climbers, because archaeologists is not professional climbers. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to have some help. But it's it's also a place where every spring, the water from the mountains are let down this way, and every year they put sediment and things over. So you have to go okay. really deep. Mm -hmm. uh, but we found the glass there and I have excavated glass and I have made uh, the analysis of glass. I found myself up there and there's a match. So this could be a point on the glass, we can call it the glass road, where amber was very, very valuable this time. And in, in Scandinavia, in South Scandinavian Denmark, we have tons of it. We mm. still have it's a it's it's a sport. Everybody who is on the west coast or something in Denmark try to find amber, yeah. and this it was very valuable, and yeah. we believe that the amber was the valuables coming from north to south and glass coming the other way around, because okay. in these finds in Chuklovina you have more than a thousand bees. That's absolutely the one place that you have the most, but all all, all other places you have in graves in. In treasure finds, you have amber and glass together, so they kind of interlinked with each other. So, do you find amber in in Egypt and those yes. places as well? Yeah, we have been looking for it, and and the problem is that amber you cannot do the same trip trick with amber as you can with glass. There's no chemical fingerprints that can tell you if it's from the North Sea. Uh, the Baltic Sea, or is found in the ground in Poland or Romania. Okay. In later times, historical times, you were digging, mining for amber as well. But we don't have any uh, proof that they did that in the Bronze Age. That you, that they know that they could dig into the ground and find maybe amber. But we yeah. cannot we cannot analyze it to be sure. And that mm. makes it difficult. And that's the reason why it's still hardly debated where from the amber comes. Mm. And the mm. same thing is you have young amber that's called resin. And young mm. amber you find in other places as well. So when you look at the amber from Egypt, many times they have been classified as resin mm. because the archaeologists at that time didn't believe that amber from the north could travel that far. But right. uh, as there's uh, one special piece from a priest in uh, buried in, in, not in the Valley of the Kings, but just outside. Have you ever been to Egypt, to Luxor? No, I haven't. No. I've been bicycling around when you could that where, as a student. It was a lot of fun, so I know it by heart. And, and it's, there's a lot of graves that is not that impressive, but the people are living on top of them anyway, and they are all, all over the place. And mm -hmm. one of the places they have found a priest who, who had a, a very nice big piece of jewelry. And then there's a, 
there's a scarab in the middle made of amber and uh, around the setting is glass. And here, once again, you have the combination of amber and glass. So mm. the combination of amber and glass is linked all the way from the female and the woman with the broken sword in Sealand in Denmark and all the way to Egypt. And mm. also in the tomb of Tutankhamun, they had a big necklace with beads made out of, they call it resin, but uh, I believe it's amber beads. Mm -hmm. I d ha haven't had the opportunity yet to go through the finds myself. But, okay. Um, that is, um, that's, that's just amazing. I mean, come on. Uh, awesome. It is, isn't it? <laughs> so, uh, does, I mean, I don't really know much about amber and how it's, it's made. I have a little bit of an, a bit, a little bit of knowledge on it. Um, can you, is amber found in Egypt? Is that something that can be found in that area, or no? What, what would be the closest region where you know where amber is kind of a prevalent thing? Um, I, I, my knowledge in amber is not that great anyway, but it's uh, more than for sixty to forty million years ago, there were forests in the places where they are seen now. Okay. And it's actually, uh, it's from the trees. It's it's kind of, I don't know the proper English word. Um, it's my second I, I, language. It's, I've always thought of it as like the sap that you get from the yeah. tree, that kind of it's sticky that the resin word? that comes out. I think, I think so, it's, yeah. That's yeah. the word that I use. It might not be the right it, word. It is. And it's this sticky juice coming out of the trees. Yeah. And sometimes it catches insects and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's that where you just, if you t take the bark away, you get that sticky. We, yeah. we call it a sap. I don't know. That's probably not the, the correct word, but that's what I, I, that's what I, I know. Yeah, yeah. 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 And and in a process, a chemical process of being at the bottom of the sea, it, it gets hard. And that okay. turns it into amber. You also have the young amber, and that's called resin or something else. But if it's been there for millions and millions of years, it turns into to be this beautiful light material. Mm -hmm. In in Greek, old Greek, it was called electron, uh, el electronic, actually, because when you put it into cloth, it has a, a electro small electric field around it. So uh, the, the idea of something getting electric is actually from amber. And it was... Mm. And that's oh. why it, they thought it was a special magical um, uh, stone. So that's, that's so cool. Yeah, <laughs> especially, so, so, especially you think about back then as well when you don't know what electricity is, and I guess even if you got like a little static shock off it, you'd be like, "What the fuck is this?" Like yes. it would be something that was that was amazing. Yeah, and I, I still get that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, and, and magical, and se they thought it was yeah. sent from the from the gods, and also they thought it was the tears of the sun god Apollon. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Okay, so so this is this is really awesome, right? So we but what we're establishing here is that Scandinavia in uh, uh, three thousand three hundred years ago was uh, linked to the Mediterranean and linked to uh, the Middle East. Uh, uh, through trade routes, mm. and this is, uh, I think, fairly different from how people generally conceive of this. The relationships between European peoples and and North African and and Middle Eastern peoples in this period of time. Um, obviously, I think you know when you're as a mythologist myself, there's you know you, it's pretty easy to see that there's been. A, Cross pollination in different ways, and in, in in the mindsets and the, the ideas that people have had, um, and they must of course come from some some kind of connection, right? But but it's hard to to necessarily like place it in time, so to speak. But this I think is a very obvious uh, uh, example of, of 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 interactions, and I think it was relatively recent that there was a um, Norwegian article. Uh, I think that talked about how the Bronze Age was actually like, you know, 
a Viking age, mm. uh, in a sense. And um, is, is that your take on it as well? That this yeah. is a, they actually called uh, the Bronze Age the Small Viking Age. And one of the other reasons is that one of the most uh, pictured uh, items of the Bronze Age is actually the ship. Yeah. And uh, the general um, idea that I share with a lot of my other Scandinavian colleagues is that the seamanship, being a sailor and being able to to control trade routes via the sea and rivers were actually uh, held by South Scandinavia. Mm, yeah. Also because it's, it's very natural that this uh, Denmark is a, a, a country made of a lot of islands. We have, uh, uh, we have Jutland who is uh, connected with uh, Germany. Uh, the rest is islands. So you are actually... Uh, being uh, forced to sail to get to the other islands, and that was a that was a, one of uh, of the things that made this area particular uh, in the trade routes, because then you could dominate the others because you knew knew about uh, building ships and trade routes uh, beforehand. Mm -hmm. And also, if you look throughout Europe, actually Denmark is absolutely one of the most rich areas only greece is more rich in the bronze age than denmark we have gold we have massive bronze now we also have uh, uncovered that we actually have uh, quite a lot a lot of glass beads as well that was very mm -hmm. valuable so this is was uh, a, a, a very rich society and also a society who who was ve very well connected with the rest of Europe, and and you can see it in the way they made their their objects. The swords looks very much what they look like in Greece, in in Germany, all other th places. Also, if you now we are talking about science, strontium analysis shows that um, uh, two females as now didn't. I wasn't born in Denmark, was born in, in Germany and uh, Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. So so there was a lot of of traveling back and forth. Uh, okay. and, and that also what probably made South Scandinavia stronger than one should think because beforehand we had an idea that the Mediterranean were the powerhouse. This was mm -hmm. where the superpowers were. This is where uh, the cradle of civilization were. And the further away you came from the center to the periphery, the poorer and more barbarish the people were. So that, that's, that's, straight up, that's straight out of the uh, medieval mapping, by the way. That's how they, yeah. they drew maps, like, like a circle around the Mediterranean. And the Mediterranean was the civilization, everything around it was barbaric. <laughs> Absolutely. And that was also what many of our colleagues back in time, they were colored by that uh, perception. And, yeah. and actually now we can see by our analysis that this was uh, a society in their own right uh, with uh, uh, very skilled sailors. They had a lot of ships. They controlled trade. They actually had a very um, complex society who traded all the way with the Mediterranean. And also they had, you can see that the female graves were just as rich as the male graves and they were buried with we weapons. So mm -hmm. that could make us uh, conclude or have an idea about that uh, women had more to say here than rest of the world. The same was actually also, <laughs> you're smiling. Yeah, but uh, actually... Um, in, in in Egypt as well, they were they were more more free uh, the women, mm -hmm. and and if you look at the outermost uh, area to the north in Denmark, we can see that the female had a special role also in in um, in the cult in the religion, mm -hmm. because there's another um, grave that I'm very fond of where you had a a woman buried with a lot of magical items. She had a tooth from a horse, and you can see that she has been touching it 
uh, with her thumb, thumb. So there's a mark from her thumb, and there's a right and left foot from a hedgehog. There's a, a hedgehog. Hedgehog, yes. <laughs> and and a piece of lamb and a piece of human, and there's a also a piece from a raven. And there's uh, some of of uh, the uh, uh, the skeleton of a snake, and this snake is the Escolapse snake. That is, uh, if you see this uh, medical sign where you have a stick and a yeah, yeah. and a snake around it, that's the one. And it only lives by the Mediterranean, as far mm. as we know. Okay, so just just take it back a little bit. How you said the. Um... Obviously, they were, they were trading with the Mediterranean. Would that be a case of sort of them sailing around? Would, would would they sail all the way around to kind of Italy area, or was it just mainly land where you would go across? They used the rivers. The rivers were oh, the okay. uh, high roads of this that, that time. So you can get all the way through on on the rivers. More or less, there are some points where you had to walk a little bit, but then, and you have to cross the Alps if you're going to Italy. But then there, there would would have been uh, routes that were very well mapped, and people knew this way, and they knew the people down the road. Maybe they were in family. That could explain mm-hmm. why we have some some women from from uh, Eastern Europe and also from South mm-hmm. Germany. That that you actually were in 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 family with uh, with the ones you were trading with, and then you could have some some safe passage all the way down because that's the key the key thing. Every time you wanted in the past to trade, you have to guarantee the safety of the traders. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and that's the same thing in the Viking Age. And and I mean, yeah, you know, just just to, to throw something in here, like yeah, that's the same in the Viking Age, and we also like we have, uh, you know, when it comes to the medieval period, we don't even question these connections, right? Where it's it's so typical that you see somebody going to Rome, for instance, from Norway or from Denmark or or, or something like that, and on the way, they 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 stop in by family members and and hang out at somebody's castle it's usually you know, the nobility that we have source material on in, yeah in of this course case right um so, so i mean we don't question that when it comes to the medieval period we we are starting to to get more open about it when it comes to the the viking age and perhaps also a little bit about the, the iron age right but 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 i still think you know i think it's still you know very much like something that's hard for people to grasp that, that people could have been doing this all the way back in the bronze age and to be honest this is what i don't understand i i don't understand why it there tends to be this idea that you know people back in the day they were just like sedentary and never really left their little plot of land and you know you gotta ask how the hell did they get there in the first place then yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> and also the the thing is with these trade uh, routes and and ways to go down sometimes when there was stability and and the trade was was up and running everything was fine and you could make the the trip and there was no danger but sometimes the the political situation shifted and there were wars breaking out and and 1200 bc 3200 years ago they were uh, a breakdown in the the um, trade in the mediterranean and that actually affected all the way through to us in Scandinavia because then there were no more blue, blue glass bleeds. It okay. stopped. And, and that mm. shows that they had a connection. But then the whole trade system broke down and then the connection was gone. Okay. What was, so, that? was, that, the, uh, was that the fall of Troy? No, no the- it was uh, the sea people. The sea, okay. uh, and that's a massive uh, migration coming up from northern Greece, uh, heading down to uh, Mesopotamia and North Africa. It's actually the same as we saw in 2015, where there was a lot of migration going the other way around from North Africa and Syria military, uh, over the Mediterranean to Greece. They just mm. went the other way, so to speak, okay. because at that time, Everybody wanted to go to the wealthiest places 
at that time it was the mid, mid, uh, Middle East and North Africa. Yeah, and and that uh, that they totally crushed uh, the trade cities in the eastern Mediterranean. There was uh, some of the cities never came back, uh, yeah. so that set this area back five hundred years or more. So when you have a trade route like that, whether it's one in the Bronze Age or one in the the Viking Age. Is it a case of the one person takes takes the goods all the way, or is there a network where, you know, you would take it so far and then sell it to maybe somebody a hundred miles away, and then they would take it and take it a little bit further, and it would be a gradual thing, or is it just one one person goes the whole way, does the trade, and then comes back? Like, do we know how that works? No, we don't. But I guess it's a bit the bit of both. Okay. As uh, this, uh, we call it down the line trade. Is where mm-hmm. you actually sell it off and and get a little bit profit every time. So yeah. the glass beads is worth nothing down in Egypt. When you come to Germany, it's pricey, and when it comes mm. all the way to Denmark, it's it's uh it's almost unpayable. Uh, well, that yeah. I mean, <laughs> to put it into modern terms, that kind of sounds how drugs works. With you know how with with anything like that, with with I guess with cocaine or heroin it's it's dirt cheap where it's produced but you know every as the, the steps it goes through people add a little bit on and it eventually to the end user it gets more expensive it's most that, things and yeah. it's, it's most things it doesn't even have to be drugs it can be avocados or you know <laughs> yes <it's> cocoa <laughs> but <laughs> but still the glass beads are so small that you can in one backpack you can have a thousand so yeah. you also, if you made the trip, if you went three years, it could take you to go to Egypt and back. But then you had your fortune made if you yeah. made it back with all of them. It's very lucrative that way, you know. I mean, it is. It, it's like a it appreciates so much in value that you know. Yeah, as you say, you're you're you're, you're made at that point, right? I, I yeah. guess you could sell a few on the way as well if you need it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but 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 you don't want to show how many you have back. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. You've, only got, you've only got two. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so okay, so 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 let's try to uh, move into uh, you know eras that are a little closer to 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 our modern time, to the Viking Age and all that stuff. Um, mm-hmm. So Tacitus he writes about the peoples living around that northern sea up there, which is probably the Baltic. Um, and and he he also notes that they're trading amber. So it seems like this is still something that is happening some uh, thirteen hundred years later, um, in in, uh, in 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 the first century uh, uh, after the year zero, and and then we have um, as we also talked a little bit about before we started recording. Like we, then we have you know the the uh, that long. Um, Sort of like a, a highway towards the Viking Age, where more and more connections are, are being established by people in Scandinavia and, and elsewhere in Europe. Uh, do you want to give us a little bit of an insight? Like, are we dealing with simply just um, because uh, what I'm getting at here is that usually, with uh, I think we first of all when we talk about the Viking Age, it's always this you know stereotypical. It starts in 793 and they come out of nowhere. Of course, if you're a scholar. You know that that's not true. Um, when we also have the migration period, and uh, sometimes uh, we also get the same notion about the migration periods, like oh, uh, all of a sudden these Germanic peoples come like half naked and dirty out of the woods with axes and start killing Romans, which is also not entirely true, right? Mm. Like, are we dealing with sort of like a stable level of just like connection between Northern Europe and Southern Europe and you know, Eastern and Western for that matter? Um, with dips and then you know goes up again and so on uh, since the Bronze Age or like what is your take on all of that? Yes, uh, absolutely. There has been a connection and and it has also has been more intense in periods and then go back. But in the the Roman Empire time, they they conquered uh, England and they almost succeeded in conquering most of of Germany uh, but they lost the the ba- big battle um 
in Teutoburger Wald. And um, it's, it, but they stayed in connection uh, with the people living here. And this is in the century after the birth of Christ. And here we see a massive influence of uh, everything from weapons, the swords, sword blades from, from the Roman Empire was very popular. And actually in Denmark, we have the largest collection of Roman swords because instead of reusing the iron when they got old or just throwing them away, we, we offered them to gods in our box, in our rivers. And now archaeologists have dug all of this stuff out and we have a thousand or more of Roman blades. Uh, so would that, would that kind of mean that they saw them as something special rather than, like you say, just melting them down and reusing? Because surely that would have made more sense if it was inconsequential, just melt it down, make a new sword. To, mm -hmm. to throw it away seems silly unless it means something. Yes, and it does. Uh, it it was a way. It's it's difficult to say why they made these mass massive offerings, but they some new finds in Denmark shows that probably they left the the one who was beaten uh, uh, on laying on on the battlefield. Then they plundered them, and they were just lying there until the bones were bear and then they collected them and throw them out throw them out into the lake and Is all that what we see at the at Ilo of Odale and, yes. and Moster and yeah, yeah yeah so those huge sites out just outside of uh, Skenabor south of Aarhus right right and yeah. and um then it's the two where you have all the bones and when you where you have the the um, weapons are, are not at the it's not the same uh, battle because there's more than 200 years apart of those two right. uh, events happening. But the in Ilorup, they offered uh, more than a thousand soldiers equipment. And uh, that gave a, a insight into the, the, uh, the armies that they had at this time. And, and, the question is, of course, why do they offer so great values? Mm. And maybe it's because they want to show off. They want to show how a, a massive show to sh and, and a, a small king or what you would call him would establish him a, at that time with this great offering. That would be the way to, to make him um and the right uh, king of this this area so people would be uh, admiring him and afraid of him probably. I, I, I guess you know so we we could perhaps look at uh, uh, other peoples who seem to have been thinking in similar terms and at this point i'm 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 thinking south of the border that i'm at um uh, the Aztecs, Mayans, right? They, they mm. do seem to be doing similar things, offering like, serious values at a lot yeah. of people. Right? They do. Um, yeah. And they are also a very, uh, uh, a, a belief that is spilled around battles and mm. being a soldier and a warrior, a very violent mm -hmm. kind of religion. Uh, and that's also a, an aspect of the Viking Age and the mentality of the Viking Age, but it has very, very deep roots. Mm -hmm. We see them more than 500 years before the first attack on Lindisfarne in 793. We see them all, all, already here where they're fighting mm -hmm. with each, each other in South Scandinavia. And those big, massive hordes of offerings of 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 um, of weapons, of personal equipment, in these box and lakes, show that Scandinavia has been a fierce warrior people for hundreds and hundreds of years before the beginning of the Viking Age. So, how valuable would iron have been at the time? I mean, in the sense of the nowadays, you know, it's iron's kind of it's something and nothing. You don't really think of it as a valuable material, but I assume back then it wasn't, you know, it was something that you would, 
reuse um, and will be worth something. So it just, like I say, it just seems crazy to throw all these swords away unless you've got a bunch of your own that you can take the place. You know, you're not going to throw swords away that are good if um, if no. you don't already have some. And and they were burned and bent and and smashed in order not for others not to get the idea to go back when all the the party was over. Then you sneak back and get yourself a good sword. You couldn't because they, so were... they were they were destroyed before. Absolutely, yeah. That and... that seems so insane to me that they were. <laughs> There must have been some some reason for it because if you're going to destroy it, then why not bur- why not melt it down and make new iron goods from it? So they obviously wanted to keep them in the form of swords, but also didn't want anyone to use them. But it's like why? <laughs> it's the same. You could say the same about the Aztecs. Why why was it necessary for thousands and thousands of people to? be offered to the sun god why why do that but it's it's part of their belief system their religion and it was a demand from the warrior god maybe that they to ensure to have a a, a prosperous uh, battle next time mm-hmm. they should give a part to the warrior god to show that they were obedient to the mm-hmm. gods and have the favor of the gods uh, and this, uh, there's, uh, I think there's more than 30 of these big uh, um, offerings in in Denmark at uh, for uh, 400 years or something. And then they yeah. stopped. So one co- question, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Up Okra, uh, which is now southern Sweden, but presumably uh, Denmark, um, at least in the Viking Age, but maybe even before then, uh, in Skåne. Uh, has this little uh, temple and everything. It's actually not that little um, for at least Viking Age standards. Uh, a temple site. I know, you know, in archaeology, uh, 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 we tend to call them cult houses instead. Um, mm. but, but let's be real, it's a temple, right? <laughs> it is a temple, yeah. <laughs> so, these, so as far as I remember, there's a ditch dug around it where they have also put weaponry in. Is that correct? Yes, um, but not not as many as in in p- beforehand. But it it is correct that Up Okra kind of takes over as a temple where you can see the natural temple was outside in the nature. Mm-hmm, yeah. Before that, you don't have any buildings that archaeologists could say was formed around as a temple. The nature was the temple for the people mm-hmm. before. But yeah, then, these temple sites they show up in the five hundreds, right? Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, four five hundred. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, that's around the time when they. And that's where, at the same time as we don't, we we stop finding uh, weapons or that many weapons anyway in in uh, the box and lakes. They were put in other places, but we also have these temples. They are actually there's a new one in. Uh, in uh, southern Jutland, that could seem that it was it could be uh, earlier. Right, that's uh, not so far from Ripa, right? Yeah, yeah. But so, they're so not. Also... But they're not. They are not finished digging there, so we have to wait patiently yeah. <laughs> for the resu- for the results. <laughs> yeah, but that would that would also be incredibly interesting because I mean, Ripa as a uh, a site for the Viking Age is. Mm-hmm. Probably one of the most important places. Uh, I mean, Søren Sindbæk, uh, Danish archaeologist, has uh, proclaimed it's sort of like the, the the site that begins the Viking Age. I mean, yeah, I, in, I don't in, know if you want to be that categorical about things, but no, uh, you should be that categorical when you you are the one who is head of the dig. Um, yeah. but but it's <laughs> but uh, that he at some points he's absolutely right because it's the oldest city in Denmark and. The Vikings, Scandinavia too. Is, uh, uh, Scandinavia as well, and yeah. um, the Viking Age was was probably most famous by by its warriors, but it, they were also very keen traders. Yeah, yeah, and, absolutely. And that's exactly what Ribe shows. Yeah, and see, this is this is what you know uh, for me as, as sort of like a, I guess at this point some kind of Viking Age scholar because that's what I teach and, and write about and all that stuff. Uh, you know, this might be self sabotage, but what we're really getting at here is that 
the Viking Age is then, I guess, not that special when it comes to connection, warfare, trade, all of that stuff, right? No, <laughs> it, it's it, it actually fits very very well what we know about what's coming before. Yeah. Uh, but it's kind of like that. This is when Scandinavia mm. gets its uh, its debut in in world history because. Before that, there was no written records. They were probably um, uh, wa warfare was against each other. It was not uh, kind of uh, making uh, their way through to the written sources at any time. But then they started. And it began already in the 500s where you have one Danish king I think the lat the Latin word is very difficult, but it's something like uh, chocolaicos, I think. Yeah, ch chocolaicos, yeah. Chocolaicos, yeah. In, in, in the Old Norse. Yeah. Uh, Hugelak in, in Old English, as far as I remember. Yeah, and yeah. He, uh, he attacked uh, the, the Frankish coast in something like 500, in the beginning of 500. Yeah. And yeah, he right. almost made it back from the plunder, but he was caught in, uh, in the tide. Mm. Yeah. At the beach. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> why, why the Viking Age? Why, I mean, why like 7, 793 to 1066 is that? The Vikings, and if this was going on before, I mean, I don't want to be that that typical Brit that thinks everything revolves around us. But obviously, <laughs> it seems like it starts with it starts with Lindisfarne and then ends kind of in 1066 when William the Conqueror comes up. Um, is that is that just inconsequential that it seems to be when it evolve, revolves around like mm. the UK? Yeah. Or it Probably because it was British archaeologists who made the f or historians who made the first call on that one, I guess. That is exactly what it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, so it is that is that definition of the Viking Age is, is known as the Anglo Scandinavian definition, where it is. It's, it's entirely framed by by historical crosses in the British Isles. Um, in Scandinavia, we tend to have a, a, a longer span for the Viking Age. Mm -hmm. Uh, oh, based, based on archaeology, yes. <laughs> um, but I mean, uh, one one significant thing to happen in the Viking Age is, of course, uh, the, the way that uh, Scandinavian elite becomes integrated with uh, uh, British uh, elite, uh, both in the English area in Scotland and, of course, also uh, continental elites to some extent. Uh, yeah. The Normans are, are a great example of this. Um, but also before that, because you have... Uh, Harold Clark, who yeah. who gets he's the first Danish king to get baptized in eight hundred twenty six, mm -hmm. and uh, he he uh, he um, he makes a deal with the uh, emperor, a uh, Frankish emperor called uh, Ludwig uh, the Pious. What, yeah. What's the the English term? Is the, name the Pious? Yeah, the Pious. Yeah, yeah. Pious. yeah. And uh, he um, gets a piece of land from where he should uh, protect the Frankish coast from incoming Vikings. And he has, uh, in return, got the uh, backup army to conquer back the Danish throne. Mm -hmm. But he never makes it. Yeah, and, and, and he, he doesn't keep the Vikings from uh, hitting on the shores of France they he kind of helped them so it was a bad deal from uh, for the frankish uh, emperor anyway Seems but like the, a jerk. <laughs> he really does but he also kind of opened up for the eyes of uh, the the danish royal families that were non grata by the one horik the first sitting on the throne there was a lot of other family members who wanted their own piece of land and they they saw that Harold he made it happen, so they kind of took the chance as well, and they nearly got England in the mm -hmm. process, actually. With the great Heenan army that comes. You know, yes. Uh, after. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. So 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 that means then that we have, um, I mean, I I guess you know 
we're, uh, when we go back to the Bronze Age, we're still dealing with the uh, interactions again, of course, and 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 marriage alliances uh, to the extent that we can understand them, right? I mean, that's mm. that's why we're finding uh, people from, from from southern Germany and Eastern Europe in 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 the Danish area. Um, so that's simply, I guess. No, I guess we're landing back on that thing of like the Viking Age is just a, not that special. <laughs> the only thing that distinguishes it is that Scandinavians become Christian. To, to me, it seems it seems like the very typical idea of whoever writes history kind of creates their own, you know, puts their own little stamp on it. Like you say, it, it's the British archaeologists or the, the who make the Viking Age the years that it is. When in reality, you put it in this little box. When it's not that, it's not that accurate. And I guess like uh, people who listen to this might wonder why we talk about the, the Bronze Age so much and the Iron Age. And you know, I think to understand a group of people and to why they are who they are, you have to look at what comes before yeah. and what what makes them them who they are. And, and you know, everybody's history makes and everybody's past makes them who they are. Yeah. Um, so. Did you say that before that you were working on the role of women in kind of like the the Bronze Age, Iron Age, and I guess does that go all the way up to the Viking Age as well? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's uh, uh, that's one of the very interesting things about uh, working with the past because you have you are looking into a world with a, a different set of of norms and beliefs than you have today. And that's why you have to be very, very open-minded when you see um, the the clues the Earth gives you as an archaeologist. Um, one of the clues they give you is that uh, within the last 15 years, uh, a lot of metal detectorists in Denmark, amateur archaeologists connected up with the local museum, goes out to the fields searching for metals and they find a lot of interesting pieces and they do find a lot of small figurines it could be a brooch it could be something attached to something a pen or attached to some kind of jewelry or something we don't know what is but it shows women with weapons mm-hmm. and that could be uh, uh, the Valkyries the Valkyries is the 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 servant women of Odin who flies down to the battlefields and cho- chooses the the warriors they want to have with them back to Valhalla mm-hmm. and there's you would know that Matthias there would be a lot of myths and legends uh, about the Valkyries. Yeah, so speaking about uh, connections to 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 farther south when it comes to Scandinavia and, and this particular subject, and what we see is that uh, in the Rhineland area from, from like the, the the first century and into up until uh, they then become Christian, um, we have this development of of the cult of the Matrona, um, yeah. as it is called, and uh, this is. Uh, it, it's sort of like a broad cult of uh, different female deities that seem to all have connections to aspects of fate, both life yeah. and death. And this very much, uh, it, if you ask me, seems like the basis for some of these ideas that we see in Nord- Nordic mythology yeah. written down much later, right? Um, and the Valkyries belong to this overall the complex of, of female uh, deciders of fate, basically. Yeah. Whether they're Norns or Valkyries, I don't think it had m- mattered much to the people back then. They they sort of like had this general idea that 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 um, you know at some point uh, there's a there's a woman that's going to decide whether you live or die. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and also that could be a lot of men, to be honest. <laughs> that, that could ring true for. Us. But now it is. <laughs> and, and you also have this old text from Germany from the period just before they got the Christianity really got its uh, take on for, on people called the Merseburg Saubersprüche. Mm-hmm. And, and that's uh, uh, some kind of songs or special um, uh, poems where you have these women called Idisia. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and one of the one of the sentences is to when in the midst of battle they can free you from the the um, uh, the the bonds of battle. They could make you go free. So they also can help you escape. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so you have a lot of uh, of legend of these warrior women helping maybe otherworldly but mm-hmm. then again you also have some graves like in the bronze age where you have women buried with weapons so i guess i guess what i have to ask is obviously you get the valkyries as kind of like a, a almost a legendary mythical figure yes. so how does that relate to the role of real women in the Viking age. Cause I guess, you know, it's, it's very much a, a modern conception of like a shield maiden, a very, sh- a warrior female. Um, and how accurate is that? Cause that's something that people, again, people really cling on to, you know, if, pe- if somebody says they didn't exist, a lot of people get very upset about it. Yes. Um, so yeah, I just want to try and get down to what your opinions on, and especially because you've looked at, the earlier periods and whether that comes through into the Viking Age or whether we can make a, a guess based on how they were. Yeah, and that's if you say the other way around that there were female warriors in as massive as, as you see in Vikings, uh, then to uh, scholars they shake their head and say that's that's fiction. <laughs> but somewhere between those two, I guess we have the Viking Age, but because you cannot deny that you have two distinctive graves one in norway solur and mm. one in 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 sweden called birka and in both cases you have females being buried with a war horse and uh, a w- wide range of different weapons the axe the sword the arrows and you cannot you cannot argue out of the fact that it's a woman buried with full warrior gear there's no way around that so then you're up to have they been in battle mm-hmm. and that's the big question if uh, a newly documentary on national geographic everybody who has disney plus the streaming they know this because it's it's there and and they conclude that uh, the one in Soleur has a, a mark in her forehead so maybe she was killed in battle Okay, but it hasn't been published in peer review, so mm. so we are still waiting on that to see if it holds up by the critics. <laughs> That's how our this is how it is with uh, with archaeology and 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 deep history. Uh, but it seems like that they are absolutely buried with weapons, and we have some in Denmark as well. We have one very strange grave. It's a woman. And she is buried with a spear. It's just outside mm. Roskilde in Sealand. And beside her, there's a man who has been hanged. And we have been, and I have been writing this in my book, that this should be a woman, uh, maybe a vulva or a warrior. She has been buried with a slave. Mm. But now, okay. there has, but there now there has been fresh new DNA. And they are mother and son. That's right. Yes. Yeah. 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 And you have a saga telling about a mother and son. She is a, she is a vulva or a sorcerer and they are caught up and she has been stoned to death and he has been hanged and they're buried in the same grave. Here you have a female with a spear that could show that she is a sorcerer and she has three big massive stones on top of her, stoned to death, maybe. And then you have her son beside her that has been hanged. It fits one-to-one with the saga. Mm -hmm. And and it's it's really, um, it's mind-blowing for us archaeologists that you can come so close and what, and we don't know what it means. We, Um, is this, is this actually the, the saga mm -hmm. right there? Or is it a practice that in the days where you have Christianity coming forth, that this was uh, a punishment for a sorcerer and her son. We don't know. 
and it's just fresh news I got here. So, so, so we how, haven't got our mind around how to figure this out. How common was was being hanged? It's, it's not something I, I think I've necessarily heard of before from the Viking Age. Is it, oh yes, is it a common punishment to be yeah. to be hanged. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but then you also have Odin, he hanged himself. And if you mm -hmm. wanted to have an insight into another worldly uh, insight, you had to sit beneath a hanged man. And actually, okay. it, when you go into Christian times, they say we get our knowledge not from sitting under hanged men. So <laughs> sitting on a, under a hanged man is, is old sorcerers, uh, sorcery. Could that, I mean, could that be... I guess, because obviously when somebody's hanged and if, say, the rope broke or they was cut down and you get to that euphoric almost point just before death and you, you know, where, I guess, where chemicals are released into, into the brain, could that be, be an explanation for like Odin learning things and seeing things and people gaining knowledge? Because I guess it's that almost near death experience where you, if you if you're brought back and i i don't know but you you do kind of hear people say that asphyxiation is a very euphoric feeling i think didn't blitz Soli, uh norwegian archaeologist write about this uh back in the 90s um i haven't just come up with something new i really <laughs> for a second that thought i was onto something <laughs> no, I don't want to take away your thunder, bro. But uh, no, so I'm I'm, I'm pretty sure Brit Solli, uh, is, uh, she's a, a Norwegian archaeologist, and she's written about uh, 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 auto asphyxiation or uh, you know something about that. It's something that I vaguely uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, sort of remember from from encountering at some point. Uh, there is definitely research on it. Um, mm. So so yeah. Um, I guess you would get because you would get a DMT release from mm. your pineal gland, which would be a hallucinogenic of sorts. So that's so kind of where I was thinking. Is it, yeah. yeah, and they use uh, they use uh, drugs and 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 alcohol to get into uh, a, a state of mind where you can get a connection to another world or or. or they're trying to trigger the brain to yeah. give new insights in all various ways. Also by, um, I think it's called Herbane. Henbane. Uh, yes. Henbane, yeah. From Furket, the Furket yes. Grey. Yes. And, yeah. and this, this is a kind of weed you, you use for uh, medical purposes yeah. and you can also get very high from it, but also it can also kill you. So you have to dose really carefully. And I wonder how many people had to die before they figured it out. That's always the thing, right? <laughs> I'm always like, who? I always wonder that with some stuff. I'm like, who? Who ate this and tried it? But yeah, yeah. Aside, like, aside from that, you know, psilocybin. Uh, 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 yeah, psilocybin. Isn't that what they're called? Uh, the, the little mushrooms. Um, psilocybin. Psilocybin. Yes. Um, I mean, they grow in cow dung on most Scandinavian fields. So yeah, you know. and also in 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 the minds of the Vikings, um, a good death would also be one when you're trying out new drugs, I guess. And they also had <laughs> when when they had some a burial party, they had a saying that if only if nobody died partying, it wouldn't be a rememberable. <laughs> A burial, so one or two should <laughs> preferably die from, from drinking or fighting or eating mushrooms. That's, yeah, that's even Fadlan. He mentions that they that you know on occasion <laughs> somebody dies at the at the at the wake yeah. <laughs> because they're drinking too much. <laughs> uh, but it was a good thing. It was a good thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a good death. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, I think you know our alcohol now kind of goes through rigorous testing, but. Back then, it you know wouldn't have been tested the way it is now. So you, you could maybe get a bad batch, or so, or a batch that was a lot stronger than maybe you thought. Well, as somebody who is brewing mead myself, um, that's going to be really hard unless you can distill. Mm -hmm. And I don't think our, uh, the earliest distilling, uh, the earliest uh, archaeological evidence of distilling is from the 1300s in, in, in the Danish area, as far as I remember. Is Rosdale has written about that. 
Because you can't um, distill meat, can't you? There is, I know there's a, there's a company in Cornwall that has a, it's a distilled mead, which is like 30, 30, 40%, something like that. So that would not have been a process that at least we can identify in okay. the Viking Age. Um, uh, distilling comes into Europe uh, from uh, from the, the, the Middle East. Um, mm -hmm. That's why alcohol is, you know, Arabic word um, uh, borrowed from from um, Arabian uh, learned uh, people. Um, so yeah, no, I I don't think they they would have gotten that high uh, alcohol percentage at the time. So it was just um, the, it was just the drugs that did it. Yeah, because I mean, what you have to do is that, like, in in order to 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 get alcohol out of like say honey, right? What you have to do is you know you put honey and water into a container, and then you know you can put a couple of berries or some grain or whatever, something that has yeast on it. If you don't just use you know natural yeast from the air. Mm -hmm. And then it will ferment, and it's like a long, slow process, and and it gets to like a ten percent sounds high to me <laughs> okay. after maybe like you know six months or something like that. So mm -hmm. I I wouldn't, I, yeah, I don't know, but yeah, getting a bad batch, like of course you can. There's like different kinds of, um, like, you know, they do say that botulism is is uh, found in. Um, uh, beehives. So the bees carry around botulism, but uh, in the the, the, the the fermenting process, there shouldn't be any. Um, the pH level is not high enough, I think, or maybe low, no high enough for bot botulism to 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 develop toxins that will kill okay. you. But then again, you can never know. So um, <laughs> a lot of things can happen, especially if you just have like some kind of that standing around somewhere in a in a in a but in, in the yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that could go bad. <laughs> exactly. I think it's it's fair to remember it is a different time and you know our modern perceptions on drugs and alcohol isn't how they would have seen it back yeah. then either. You know, it would have been probably fun to experiment with different things and, and see and see what happened. And there's another thing, if you just can follow up this this uh, line, is that when you were Viking and when you were raiding and and uh, off to Europe or all the way to um, to to um, the the Black Sea or even further away, you were very conscious that the water, local water, could give you a stomach ache and make you sick. Okay. So they carried their own water, or preferably they always drink drank ale or wine. And mm -hmm. uh, it says that the, the Anglo-Saxons, they preferred wine or, or else uh, they preferred ale, but the Vikings preferred wine. And they were so keen on wine that they attacked Paris. 250 mm -hmm. men attacked Paris only because they were out of wine. <laughs> and the it monks, sounds like such a white yes, Viking thing to do. <laughs> it is. And the monks... That might be the best this, thing I've ever heard. Yeah, and the, the monks who wrote this piece said with very was very glad to to make the announcement that there were no wine left in Paris. <laughs> so it was for nothing that they attacked. I, and, I do and remember actually, that story now. <laughs> yeah, and the Vikings also were um, were tending as a. Um, special a special guard a Varagian guard for the Byzantine uh, emperor in Constantinople and they by the locals in Constantinople they were called the vine bottles <laughs> okay. and, and and you can imagine why mm -hmm. yes they were well, well fond of drinking. <laughs> we, it actually does yeah. say in, in, in one Eddic poem, uh, one of the oldest one we have, Grimnismal, as it is called, I think. It's, I, I think at this point we've landed on sometime, like composition date sometime in the 11th, late 11th century. Can't really be entirely sure. There's definitely original pre-Christian uh, ideas all over that poem. Um, but yeah, that, it, in that poem it says that Odin actually drinks wine. Uh, so, so that's that's what he does. And that's that's all he gets: wine, no food, nothing else. 
Yeah. <laughs> is that is that the one where he only drinks wine and gives all his food to his dogs? Is that yeah? Is that really is that really like that? Pardon? Uh, yeah, to Gary and Frankie. So so the the wording and all this stuff. This Snorri Sturluson interprets this in Etta as uh, two dogs or wolves named Gary and Frankie. Uh, the same with who in the moon that are uh, interpreted as Raymond's. But that's actually mm -hmm. not really what you get from the poem. What you get is, uh, you know, euphemisms for war and also for magic and for um, the spirit leaving the body. Um, okay. he, so, so who in the moon are not mentioned as Raymond's in the poem. They're mentioned as uh, a who which means mind and moon means memory or, or thought of some kind. Uh, so, so that's really what he's talking about. He's saying that he is worried that they will leave him because they fly over the world every day. Um, in, in the part about Gary and Freiki, that very much hints at war because Gary and Freiki, uh, words that um, mean something like uh, uh, greedy and um, it's hard to translate Freiki, I think, uh, to, into English. Um, we have it in modern Danish as Freik. Um, which has an entirely different connotation, um, uh, sort of like cheeky or or, or even like some it has sexual. Meant in like a hint of like strapping young warriors that will uh, uh, kick your ass. So that's actually more what 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 these stances are about. But Snorri Sturluson then turns that into like. Uh, personifications of animals um, in his okay. uh, description is actually really interesting because it says a lot of uh, a lot about um, also what we were talking about before with like knowledge rituals and and um, uh, going through various kinds of uh, physical processes or or you know drug induced processes to to gain knowledge in in initiation rituals and and all of that stuff that's definitely part of this complex right here. And it has implications for um, um, the initiation of warriors as well. Um, there's, if you ask me, there was definitely a a like a uh, mis mystical um, occult even uh, side to um, the Viking Age warrior, at least in pre-Christian time, uh, their their status and and what they would be doing. They would definitely get initiated into uh, a warrior cult uh, that belonged to Odin, um, which would also probably involve some kind of ritual that would bring them close to death um, in one way or another. And this is, you know, if we look broadly in, in you know, compar uh, comparative religion, you can see that this is a very standard thing, actually, um, for a lot of cultures to have those types of rituals, um, to have. Uh, you know, rituals that include uh, intoxication and singing as part of your um, uh, process of being initiated into warriorhood. And something like you know, joining a frat house. Oh, it's totally the same as joining a frat house, uh, except frat houses aren't as cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it, we have these um, 100 and something um, uh, uh, skulls. Uh, with filed teeth from from the Viking Age as well. Shinedi, you probably know more about this than I do. Um, they very much hint, I think, at, at some kind of like uh, initiated warrior cult. Um, Absolutely. And also yeah. we have them from graves in Sweden. We have them from Sealand and also the, the, the Funen, just outside uh, the birth town of Hans Christian Andersen, Odense. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a, 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 a graveyard where you have Vikings, and they are not rich burials. They mm -hmm. are just normal people. And here you have uh, what I call veterans. You have mm -hmm. uh, uh, warriors. They don't have swords or these very uh, high, high uh, class, high ranking uh, burials. They are straight up into the ground with a small knife and some small things so these are not wealthy people mm. but you have uh one of them with with teeth filed 
mm. and where you have this tattoo on your teeth. It's the same as you find in mm. Sweden, but you also have them in mass graves around Oxford, and they're around yes. a year thousand uh, where you have Svein Falkbach uh, uh, attacking uh, England and Ethelred. Mm -hmm. the and so would that, the, the Oxford graves here, uh, the mass graves, are we talking about the St. Bryce massacre graves or? They may be St. Bryce because okay. Ethelred, uh, he, Bryce, he, yeah. he wrote out to his people that he should kill off all the Danes because they keep hitting the the coast and making him pay. Mm. <laughs> and and as you can hear, he's not called Ethelred the Great, like Alfred Great. Mm -hmm. So every time it's a it's a nice thing to know that if they had a a, a, a strange nickname like uh, Ethelred the Unready, I think it was the uh, English the Ethelred the Unadvised, I think it's yeah. in in, well, in modern well, English. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, he was very unpopular. Mm -hmm. And he thought, well, then let's just kill off all the Danes that are living in England. And I'll be off with the Vikings. Mm -hmm. And it had the opposite effect. And yeah. and 11 years later, Svein Falkbart was the king of England. Yeah, and uh, just, just to attach a note to that, he I, I do believe that uh, later historians have pointed out that, you know, in the medieval period, that, uh, that, that, that one of the reasons that they wanted to get, out, get rid of all the Danes was that they were stealing the English women. <laughs> that <laughs> yes. was part of it, because they took baths. <laughs> Every Saturday in Danish is called Lörda. Yeah. And it's, it it means the way the day we wash. So <laughs> okay. the Viking actually washed every Saturday, and that was a problem for the Englishmen because they didn't, and and women liked and so, men so who take a bath. So <laughs> and this, really, this really puts <laughs> Some the, things never change. Absolutely, <laughs> exactly. This this really like uh, you know puts everything in perspective, right? Because at the same time, or you know, at this, not at the same time, a little earlier, um, we have Ibn Fadlan uh, looking yes. at, at at Vikings over in the Russian area, and he's like, yeah. these people are gross. They're, yes, they're, they're crazy but there's a difference. Like, <laughs> there's a difference because he came from the the high peak of cultures at this time, yeah. so they were very aware of medical treatments of. Of also that you should wash your hands to get rid of uh, diseases and stuff like this. And I have one point on this. He probably met Swedish Vikings, <laughs> and the one in England was Danish Vikings. I just have to. Say. <laughs> there we go. There's there's our moment to upset some people. <laughs> I, I accept it. I I, I like that. Yeah, we will, we will agree, but I don't think my Swedish colleagues do. But but. <laughs> But it's possible that's the explanation. Yeah, well, it, it's possible. Um, before we wrap this up, I want to just touch back on the role of women. We didn't. We kind of went a little oh, awry. Yeah. Um, so back to kind of like everyday women. Do we know what their role would have been? Yes. Um, um, good one. Yeah, we, we know a lot of the, the women because the thing is when you write history, you write about the battles and the kings and, mm -hmm. and not not often the women. The women, they are mothers, their daughters, their wives. And I assume it's often written by men as well. Yeah, they are. And, uh, of course, there are exceptions. You have Alfred the Great. He had uh, his oldest daughter was Ethelflaed, uh, the Lady mm -hmm. of Mercia. And she mm -hmm. actually led men into battle against the Vikings, and she was very fierce. And and she also had her own statue. I visited, of course. Um, in England, and uh, but but you have some women, and also Emma, who came from uh, Normandy and married first Ethelred and then Knut the Great. She is also one of these key figures that actually got a voice in the the telling of history. But there's all the others, and mm -hmm. and if you were a slave, uh, made a slave as a woman, you didn't have many opportunities. You were used for household and sex. That was the main purposes of your uh, your body and every slave in the viking age was socially dead that you have no rights at all you were the same level as a cow that's it 
And um, so if you were women and you were a slave, made a slave, you didn't have many opportunities. Mm -hmm. But if you were a freeborn woman, you had. And, and one of the things were that you were responsible for the farm. And often you had a great responsibility if your husband went away. Then mm -hmm. you were the CEO of this farm because it yeah. was a small, small company, family company mm -hmm. who got yeah. to run. And, and you had to make all the decisions. And, and you also have in the sagas uh, that uh, one of the sagas, you have a, a, a man coming and asking for job. And he was asking for the, the head of the farm as a male. And he got the message, if you wanted to be an uh, employee he, here, you have to speak with the lady of the house. Mm -hmm. And we also have at least one case, right, uh, in the Danish area, archaeological case, where it looks like an a entire village, uh, more or less run yeah. by women. It's just, uh, it, now, yeah, right? it's just north of where I'm sitting now. Uh, okay. It's a uh, it's, uh, Ranleo, 75% of all the graves were women. Okay, and, um, and you have a treasure there that is Arabic dirham, so pointing to many travels to the east to Russia, and one or two of the women has a strontium analyzed that shows that they came maybe from Poland. So here you may have a couple of slaves or thralls being brought in from the journeys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I guess how how common would it be? for each family to have a slave i guess because what i'm thinking of is if if you have a farm and the the man goes away a viking and the lady becomes in charge now obviously farm work is very very tough very hard very you know, manual labor so i imagine that the women then would have been stronger than say an average english lady because like you know do it playing hot sports or jiu-jitsu, anything like that. If you ever come against anybody who's a farmer, they have a freakish strength. There's a strength, <laughs> there's a strength that farmers have that is not like, it's almost inhuman. It's yeah. like you don't have to be big and muscular. It's just a natural strength from doing things around the farm. And I imagine, so would would the, the, the woman, if she was in charge of the farm, would she have undertaken those acts as well? Would she have had the slaves do them? It's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah, um, she would have been strong because she has, mm -hmm. from a child, she has been making a lot of work on the farm, but they would have been slaves. We don't know how many, but there are fairly a lot of them in the graves. So if we also look at before in the Roman society, 25% of the, uh, of the people there were slaves. And, mm -hmm. and, and we figure that 10 to 25% in the in Scandinavia more or less were slaves but it also depends on on the in this area have there been a lot of raids have they been taking a lot of slaves back I think it would be varying from region to region but the mm -hmm. women are more free and they can let themselves be divorced they can decide they don't want to live together with this man she can decide herself and take her part of of the property and leave and she had that both from uh, uh, Jakub Al Tatushi, yeah. uh, another Arabian uh, traveler who goes to Denmark yeah. in the what the late uh, 900s, I think. And then we also have it from the saga literature. So that's sort of like good two good points. Yeah, of, but like, you also have it from uh, um, the Gazelle. Uh, what is this called? He's he's traveling from uh, Spain in the mid 800s. And and he's traveling. Al Ghazal, yes. Uh, yeah. Al Ghazal, yeah. yeah. He is he is yeah. um, meeting up with this Viking uh, um, a Viking queen called uh, Queen Nod. Uh, and yes. uh, she, we don't know where it is because he says he's been traveling for three days and he cannot possibly go to Denmark from Spain on th in three days. People mm -hmm. are t talking about it may have been Ireland, but but it doesn't make sense. So, but he says that that he has been flirting massively with her, and then one of the men says, "Hey, hey, she is the king's wife. Maybe you should just take it a step down, pal, because mm -hmm. you could be in trouble." Yeah. And he avoids her, and then next time they meet, she asks him, "Where have you been?" And he said, "Well, 
you're the queen, I cannot, uh, we've been flirting, and she puts up a la- uh, uh, laughter and says, hey, uh, I decide absolutely who I want to talk to and who I want to be married with. That is my yeah. decision. Yeah, that's right. and, that seems uh, very, very progressive for the uh, for the age. It is, but you cannot, if you want to be, have a critical angle on what he's saying is that he is traveling to the barbarian world. And, mm-hmm. and what you lo- love the most is their world is upside down from yours. So this would have been, this story would really have uh, been been uh, a, a, a outrage in his country, who is uh, uh, the Islamic uh, mm-hmm. area. So, so it's a really good story. So maybe he he puts in a, a little bit too much. So even Fatland's got similar uh, stories in, uh, on in sex. his uh, his, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, he he talks about a lot of different peoples that he encounters, and and I think he talks about a Turkish people. Uh, I can't remember what they're called. Um, that he meets uh, sort of like in the beginning of his journey, where this uh, the 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 wife of the chieftain she like she shows him her genitals, and he's like, "What the hell?" And she's like, "Oh, uh, it's okay. These are only for my uh, my 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 husband." Uh, but uh, like so, it's like, sort of like you can see not touch kind of thing and that, that makes her okay uh, because they're Muslim they the, the key as far as I remember the description they're, they're considered Muslim so so it's just like you know they they still follow the rules uh, even though they, there are certain rules they don't follow that's sort mm-hmm. of like how it, how it comes across mm. um, so yeah no this uh, this is definitely something that would be like interesting reading at the court in Baghdad or precisely in yes <laughs> it's kind of that, but but to t- to go back to the role of women in in Viking Age Denmark, there was also uh, the point that they could, some of them it seems like could be warriors. Not everybody, like when you see Vikings or mm-hmm. Last Kingdom, have some of it as well. But but yeah. that that a few of them. If there's they if they don't have brothers or there's some kind of of lack of of family members to take over so a special kind of task, it seems like there's a social space where it's okay for a woman to ride a horse with weapons mm-hmm. and also attend war, and it's it's perhaps they are not front line. Or they are not front line of the the army. They are not in the shield wall where everything is going down. But the shield wall is also where the common soldiers are placed. Mm-hmm. If you're a poor farmer's boy, your first raid, your place in is in the first row in the shield wall. The more power you have, the more back you are. And mm-hmm. if you're on a yeah. on a horse overlooking the battle, you have a strategic place and power and here a woman can be placed absolutely as well uh, uh, as the same level as a man and and it could be that some women were filling out a role because there wasn't a son or or something went wrong so they were chosen to have this special knowledge to keep power into the family because in the viking age family were first and the Vikings didn't, they prefer men. But if there wasn't a man to fill out the role, they prefer a woman from their own kin instead of somebody taking over the place of their kin. That was the worst thing ha- that could happen. And mm-hmm. what, what about war magic? Sorry. Yeah, ma- war magic, of course. Um, yeah. That could also be an aspect because mm-hmm. the psychological f- warfare of the time were war, war magic. And they had these, and that could be the Wilmers standing there because what differs from with what what made the Vikings special, and of course there's uh, battle tactics, but also the belief is key, because mm-hmm. when you were going into battle as a Christian, you had some uh, codes of conduct, you have some moral play, mm-hmm. you don't do not attack on Christmas Eve, you don't attack in a church stuff like that vikings didn't care and mm-hmm. also 
um, that in the Christianity, women could had no role in in religion in performing religion, but Viking women did. They had a key role because they were sorcerers and they were more powerful than men. Odin learned his um, his knowledge about magic from Freya. He and he had to deliver part of the fallen men to her hall, mm-hmm. Folklam. So he had to give up some of his soldiers to learn from a woman. And that's why this, as I have been talking about from the Bronze Age and back, women had a special role, keep holding weapons, maybe not, not from being in front line of battle, but having a political and strategically position that we as archaeologists cannot get any closer, I'm afraid. Mm-hmm. We cannot mm-hmm. dig up their brain and put it into a computer and say what they thought. I'm afraid that's too bad, but that's how that it would is. Be nice. It would be very nice. And also in the Bronze Age back, we have these sorceress women who hold magical things in their graves. That shows they had a performance, um, a, a, a role of performance and guidance and leadership in religion. And you see that all the way through to the from the Bronze Age, more or less, to the Viking Age. Mm-hmm. And here you have women attending battle, or they could also do black magic. Um, they could uh, put in a spell, and then the other king would die. And it's a great power to have. And you also have the clash between the, the church and the powerful women, because the church, all power, religious power, gets into the hands of men. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. actually what we have been living with more or less since. But before that, women had a power within religion. And you can say, maybe it's a, a, a bit popular uh, thesis, but anyway, you could say that the witch once were a powerful uh, female cult leader who was turned into an enemy by the 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 church men because they were their greatest um uh, the opponents mm-hmm. in in uh, in the battle of of uh, gaining the viking minds into the world of christianity and they were of course fighting it because they their their power were reduced and that brings us back to Roskilde this grave where you have a woman and her son, who has been hanged, that maybe she was fighting to keep her power, and she got this kind of punishment. Mm. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's a great place to kind of stop that. There's one thing that we I want to just touch on before we, we end, and that is, um, obviously, you were part of an article that got a little bit of heat for um i think you, we, we spoke before and it was one sentence but it's quite similar to to when me and Mateus had our episode suggesting that they may have been gay vikings um and it kind of on this it's on the same line mm-hmm. almost so <laughs> i just wanted to, to speak about that and kind of if you want to explain what it was and maybe some of the the the, the um I guess the, not the, the whole war is the wrong word, but the backlash that maybe you received from it. Well, it was a, a piece in a, in, a, in a paper in, in Denmark. And uh, we had, I was writing it together with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Peter Pence and Dr. Lesek Galala. And they have a, 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 a research project trying to get the, trying to learn more about Viking magic and also uh yes uh, the, the thing about sex and stuff in um in in the viking age and i have a small part as well as uh looking at the female role in the viking age and we wrote a little bit of piece and, and then we we had a question down saying maybe odin was queer <laughs> and that was made the headline <laughs> Of course, it, of course it was. <laughs> yes, and, and what we were saying is that uh, Odin delivered his own own uh, part in the debate of how you can see sex, homosexuality, male dressing up as female, and the other way around, female warriors, all these uh, questions that uh, 
that we found they were found in now we have two small figurines of a male sitting one is the male sitting on a throne with two wolves and two ravens and he has a beard and he's wearing a dress and he is wearing a dress and he has a beard on so mm-hmm. what are we seeing here is this the vulva dressed uh, sitting on Odin's uh, throne, or is the throne uh, actually Odin's? And is it Odin himself sitting on it, putting on his dress to try to get into this magical world where women control the access? Have to be mm-hmm. a woman to get in. So he puts on a dress to get in. Is that what's happening and then you can you, you can discuss the different roles in in the viking age that maybe there are some some parts of magic that is 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 female and to, in order to access that you have to cheat and look like you're female so you have to dress up as, as a female mm-hmm. that's what we were yeah. discussing and we have one more it's a it's a woman dressed in the same kind of dress and it looks like she only got one eye. She has only mm-hmm. one eye. So how do we interpret that? Which one of them is the famous Odin Fralaira? That's the one with where where he or she is sitting on the throne. The other one is okay. new. It's called the Bolslone woman. Okay, yeah. And she is starting her whole own debate. Go to mm, the yeah. have a look. Uh, oh, it's really interesting. It is interesting. And we are not, we didn't make those figures. The Vikings did. <laughs> and and the thing is that that I think we have to be open-minded. We are dealing with a culture that more than a thousand years old. They are rounded by another mindset than the Christian mindset that we are rounded at. We, have, we are living in the Christian world, the most of us and have a Christian worldview. And we have to unravel that worldview in order to get in as close to the reality of the Vikings as we can. So, and that's all we are saying. That's what we were saying in this. But mm. um, we did get some some comments. <laughs> about it. Yeah, it's like how, I don't know how people think that history works or historians work or anybody that deals in this world works. you have to put ideas out there into the world and discuss them and talk about them and hear opinions and some of them are right some of them are wrong but unless you're willing to to talk about them how would you ever expect to get to the truth and it's almost like some people just think we know i think maybe they like what they know now so they don't want to hear anything that doesn't fit that narrative and they put their fingers in their ears and and get upset rather than going okay well that's interesting maybe yes and i think it's as a for my my own point of view as a researcher uh, the more the the more i know of this period of time the more doubt i get and the more Mm. more possibilities i see and more roads i see uh, and sometimes I think it's you get more in doubt the more you know. Mm-hmm. The more you know, the less you know almost. The mm-hmm. less you know, the more certain you are in, 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 in some ways, I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, it's a well, well-known confirmation bias that, uh, you know, people with very little knowledge about something, they think they know everything about it. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> We, and, you know, uh, we as scholars, we, we have uh, other types of confirmation bias, such as like uh, believing that uh, the things that we take for granted is also just taken for granted by other people. Yeah. <laughs> so this is this is where a major like disconnect in com- a communication between scholarship and the general public actually occurs. And it's, uh, <laughs> I think everybody needs a little bit of uh, training and conflict resolution these days to, <laughs> to figure these things out. Um, but that, it's, that's a good point because I guess a lot of people, they'll hear something or read something that's written by a doctor in Nordic studies like yourself, and then they'll go, okay, well, that must be 100% accurate mm-hmm. and take it as gospel when the reality is obviously it's a lot deeper than that. It's a lot more complicated than that. 
No, the disclaimer is always, you know, we're exploring. When we're when we're writing something, when you're saying something, I mean, what 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 we are trained to do is to explore uh, like a, an area of study, and and this we might not always be very good at actually making that point come across, so that people understand that. And obviously, also back in the day, I would say a lot of scholars have been writing on the idea of authority in and of itself. To basically just claim, you know what? I know what I'm talking about, and this is the truth. That's why we have the concept Viking Age in the first place. It was a Danish scholar in the 1870s who first coined the term the Viking Age. And an old colleague of mine. An old colleague of yours. Yeah, yes. the National Museum of Denmark. Yes. That's true. Yeah. yeah. And 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 that has stuck because he was of uh, of course an authority on the subject back then and. Uh, and that's that's how it goes. That's also why fly Garrick is still uh, something that people bring up in context of the Viking Age because there's a dude back in the 1600s, I think it was late 1600s, who wrote about that. That's got to be like the reason that you know they could go berserk and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And so now that's lingering too. Horned helmets aren't going away anytime soon either. Of course, no. But most... we are also finding, I'm afraid pictures what could be odin with a horn helmet so absolutely so so and that's the interesting thing right yeah. we don't have any actual helmets that have been worn in war that have horns on them but we do have a lot of like other things yeah. uh, suggesting horn helmets and you know as as teachers we you know that's one of the things that i have used in the past when i've been talking about horn helmets to my students and saying well you know what it doesn't sound particularly practical like consider the awkward moment where you get drawn down by a sword that hits you. But then on the other hand, I, I guess the samurai didn't get the memo on that one because they had horns on their helmets. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, that's not a logical uh, way to go. Uh, it, it, could just be, it could just be a ceremonial helmet. It doesn't have to be a practical exactly. in-battle helmet. Yeah. So these things are always fluid, you know, when it comes to, or the subject of knowledge is always fluid, basically. It it could have just been that one dude in the village who was a little bit trendy, wanted to try something out, put some horns on his helmet and was like, look, look what I made. (laughs) And everyone's kind of like, no, maybe not. (laughs) Yeah. Right, let's let's wrap this one up. This has been it's been fun. I think it's been informative. I think people will take a lot of information from it. Um, on that note, like I say, I always put together a sort of information pack for our Patreon followers, which I'll do for that, which kind of gives further reading on the topics we've discussed. So if you just want to support us on Patreon, it's Patreon forward slash Nordic Mythology Podcast, and like I say, there's a bunch of bonus material on there. Um, so I, I really want to say Jeanette, but I'm guessing listening to Matthias earlier on, that's not how he's pronounced. That's kind of my, my British way of saying it. Uh, that's okay. All my foreign friends call me Jeanette, so I'm used to hearing that. <laughs> so, I mean, do you want to just give people um, maybe a shout out of where they can find your work, get, get your book, anything like that, or just follow you in general? Yeah, I'm at uh, I'm at Instagram, Facebook, uh, social media, and also you can find me at the homepage of the National Museum as well. And my books are out there, and uh, hopefully more than in Danish too. Yeah, hopefully, like I say, hopefully it will be. If we, have they, any, if we have any listeners in Serbia? I mean, they're, they're yeah, <laughs> they're, not, yeah. They're, they're lucky ones. I'm they're jealous. <laughs> <laughs> so Matthias, where can everybody find you? Well, you can always find me on Instagram under my name, Matthias Nordvig. Uh recently uh, discovered a Nordvig Matthias who's definitely not me, so don't go for that one. Um, <laughs> maybe you'll be able to apply for a little blue tick now. Say that there's a uh, uh, impersonator. Yeah. I don't know how many followers you, you need for that, but I don't think I have enough. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, don't, you never know. I, I don't think it's I don't think it's down to uh follow a amount i think it's just if there's some ambiguity of it being a like a real account then i think you can mm-hmm. uh, apply for it yeah but yeah you can find me on instagram you can find the nordic mythology uh, channel on uh, facebook 
uh, I have a page for it, and sometimes when I remember it, I will post uh, links to uh, to the podcast. Um, you can also find me on my website, uh, nordicpathologychannel.com, and uh, yeah, stay away from my YouTube because I'm not using that one anymore. So, <laughs> but thanks for thanks for watching. If you do, <laughs> That's, uh, so yeah, you can find me on Instagram. Daniel underscore Farrand one and obviously through the, the come near horns of at horns of Odin or horns of Um If you enjoy the episode, please just take a moment to subscribe, leave a review and a positive rating. Like you say, it always helps us bump up in the, in the ratings and, and find more listeners. So thank you. Thank you very much. I really, I, I'm trying not to say Jeanette, but I'm just going to have to. So <laughs> thank you very much for joining us. It's been, you know, it's been lovely. Um, I really think there will be a lot to take out there for people. Uh, you're welcome. It has been fun. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much.